introduce our first two of an outstanding raft of speakers throughout the day. Um, I don't want to therefore delay their time speaking to you. So can I ask you please to welcome our first speaker, independent historian, talking on two Liverpool families, Geoffrey Green. Morning. I've got sitting comfortably. This talk is going to detail the following. One, how I found out about these two families. Two, why such research is of value. And three, something of the challenges that arise from such investigations. I was interested, and still am, in the development of commerce and business in West Africa. <coughs> I noticed an item in the London Weekly West Africa magazine, 1922. It's a letter from a man called George Christian, writing from his home in Wallasey. That's just across that small river. Sixty years ago, I read it, and I wrote to the address. Do you know anything about George Christian? Next thing I know is the new buyer of the old house had contacted the neighbours and was talking to George Christian's daughter, Margaret. In 1983, I was very young at the time, in 1983 I met Margaret and she supplied various documents and details and so on. And... Uh, Family papers and memories. Now the other family, the Powells, came to my attention when I read a letter from Mr Powell from Everton describing himself as an outlawed American Negro. It was a letter written in 1859. There was another letter in the collection, a collection published in 1974. Another letter about Powell and it pointed out his son had just qualified as a doctor. So I looked him up in the medical directory. That's pretty sneaky. The medical directory, and sure enough, there he was. Later on, I looked him up a bit further and discovered that Dr Powell had been one of the 13 black doctors in the Union forces in the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. Now, I've always found British newspapers to be very useful, and if you know of my book, Black Edwardians, you know what I mean. But discussions with veterans and family papers and official papers and all the files and all that sort of stuff, it's made me convinced that people of African birth or descent in Britain in the period 1830 to 1930 could be found across the whole country. They followed a diverse range of occupations. I was on a path which was different to that which informed others who wrote on the history of black people in Britain. And the importance of such findings is very simple. Conclusions made about the impact of dark-skinned people, dark-skinned men and women in Britain, cannot be accurate when so many of the individuals are outside the knowledge of historians. More complex is the matter of origins, by which I mean where a person has been raised in his or her family culture. Now we all know that people in Sierra Leone and Ghana, Nova Scotia, South Carolina, Trinidad, Massachusetts of African descent all have different cultural traditions. But what of the British born children? What were their traditions? Ah, oh, so much for that. Now look at this photograph. Four young lads, all Liverpool born, taken around 1908. They're the sons of Dennis McDavid, a Scottish tailor. The photograph clearly shows an African ancestry, which is through their mother, Octavia Christian. She was born in Liverpool in 1874. Her father was Jacob Christian from Antigua, who relocated to Liverpool 
around 1850. These four lads never knew their grandfather. He died in 1894. The oldest, Herbert, or Bert, on the right, served in the Liverpool Scottish Regiment, complete with kilt, in the First World War, was captured, and his leadership in a German prison camp led to a meritorious service medal. They weren't handed out with a cocoa. He was active in shipping management and got a CBE for his work for shipping connected with D-Day landings. During the Suez Crisis of 1956, when the British invaded Egypt, his advice led to a knighthood, Sir Herbert MacDavid. The second oldest son, the lad on our left, he followed his father's trade and became a tailor. The other two brothers were merchant navy officers, sailors as Ray would say, but they were merchant navy officers with men working for them. An en one was an engineer officer who died in 1942 when his ship was torpedoed off Canada, and the Alpha, the youngest, was a merchant navy officer. He got an MBE for his work in the Pacific in cargo shipping. Retired a captain in 1964 and died in 2002. He left £650,000. And they had a sister, born in 1913, who was a senior civil servant. Quite a family. Not the usual result one finds looking up an English family with its endless domestic servants and ag lab or agricultural labourers. Quite a family. That information, I think, suggests something of the value of this type of research. It also results from the publication of an article or two on his, on the lad's uh, uncle, George Christian. Because that was read by Canadian historians who were working on a television programme connected to the Canadian side of the family. Canadian side of the Liverpool family, that's not unusual either. People do migrate to Liverpool and they migrate from Liverpool. In fact, this photograph came from the Canadian branch of the family. As I said, the original patriarch was Jacob Christian, settled here in 1850-odd. He had 11 children, six reached maturity. In 1978, 1872, Jacob Christian is listed as a ship steward and a little while later he's listed as a mariner. By this time we have the six children. Jacob Christian, by 1881, was running a boarding house. He was an official of the Tuxteth branch of the Good Templars for many years. Templars are people who are against alcohol, temperance people. And they attended his funeral at St James's Cemetery. He died aged 60 in 1894. His daughter Octavia, the one who married the tailor, the Scottish tailor, had two sisters. I think you can work out their names from this list. Both migrated to Canada with their children. Rubina, the youngest, married a ship's purser from Yorkshire. They reached Canada in 1906. Julia, the firstborn surviving daughter, married a man called Lewis Rogers who, according to documentation, was born in either Jamaica or Guadeloupe. He ran a grocery shop here in Mill Street. They had six children. They moved to the coal exporting port of Barry in South Wales in 1900. And he ran a shop and kept a boarding house there and he died in 1903. Seven years later, the widow and the children moved to Canada. Jacob's Christ, Jacob Christian had three sons and they went, went into business under the leadership of George. Sorry about the photograph, it's 130 years old. George and Arthur trained with Holtz, a leading uh, international trading depot and short uh, company and um, shipping company based in Liverpool and went off to Cameroon uh, and uh, Nigeria. And at one time, Alexander here was in the timber trade in Liverpool, as indeed was his father Jacob. It's difficult to work out whether these things had been done in parallel or separately. 
Now the traders, like George Christian, they were what was once known as coasters. Everyone knew coasters came from Liverpool. Everyone has assumed they were white. But let's define a coaster. This is the words of a man who was a trader in West Africa in the 1920s and 30s. A coaster is one of those whose days are spent in the sweltering toil of African commerce, securing many kinds of native produce for European use and providing, providing in return a wide range of manufactured goods to the enrichment of the natives of Africa. This is an advertisement of the George Christian business. The following year, it became a limited liability company. I'll just pick on the main section of that advert for you. Now, there are other black merchants in uh, West African. So there were other black merchants in uh, Britain trading with West Africa. I know of at least three West Africans. Robert Broadhurst is one. Albert Alfred Kahn is another one. And Kwame Natando is a third. They all have entries in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. They also became interested and in black British-focused politics. But they were all, those three were all born and raised in Africa, which is why we go back to the six British black children of Christians. As I said, the daughter, one daughter was Octavia Christian, married that Scottish tailor. And here are the four names of the boys that we started off with, and the daughter, Edna. Octavia's brother, George, who set up that business, as I say here, he married and had three children. In the early 1910s, as the family grew, uh, brought up, they were born here and brought up here, the, the um, Christians lived and worked in Nigeria. He then sold his business to the German, to Unilever and uh, bought a plantation in, in Cameroon. Here's the family, 1922. It's George Christian in the back of the house, probably the one in Wallasey. My informant, Margaret, is sitting at the front there. Her brother is on the bottom right. Margaret was a very yellow-skinned woman. I've never met anyone who's that yellow. Okay, I, I never had the privilege of meeting John. He, he, he died uh, during the um, investigations. Right. Margaret's son is a university lecturer. The other family I want to talk about is the Powell family. The William Peter Powell left America with his six brothers and sisters in 1850. It's that year again. He travelled with his namesake father and their mother, Mercy Haskins. She was a Native American, what we used to call Red Indians. Her husband was of African descent. A Dublin newspaper reported, he's come to this country to procure for his children the educational and means of supporting themselves denied them in Boston on account of their colour. 1851. Supposedly freeborn, he escaped with the family, they're refugees, and they came to Liverpool. He's been called, this is William Peter Powell, the father, has been called a militant champion of black seamen because he ran boarding houses for black sailors in New York and in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and they were uh, havens on the route of the Underground Railroad as blacks fled north to Canada. He kept in contact with people in New York, and in 1950, 1856 he was attending a lecture here, which was um, attended also by someone referred to as Josephine the Slave, who has lately arrived here from New Orleans, accompanied by several coloured friends. She'd been hidden on a boat for 25 days. Another speaker, a white American, suggested that Josephine had bribed the customs officials in Liverpool. And the customs investigated they got Peter Powell, William Peter Powell Sr. to help along and the whole thing was found out to be a tissue of lies. Powell was described as a coloured gentleman of much intelligence. He was working for a company of marine brokers here 
in Dale Street. He was living in Field Street, Everton, in 1859. He wrote to an American and said, I came to this country a poor, despised, outcast, outlawed American Negro, driven from my native country for the colour of my skin. Two months later, the leading Irish abolitionist, Richard Welsh, said he was a poor man in the employment of others. His heart is excellent, his judgment is very small. They get back to that. What happened to the Powells? They all returned to America, probably in 1861. That's a good reason not to press bloody machines. <laughs> William Peter Powell, Jr. Born 1834. He was a doctor. Webb, that Irishman, said, he has a son, a surgeon, very intemperate, one of the stupidest men I've ever met with, in whose social position his father takes great satisfaction. I think you would take great satisfaction if you'd escaped from the threat of slavery, come to uh, uh, England and had your son go to university in Dublin and become a doctor. And now I've got no energy to deal with, with a cantankerous ex-Quaker Irishman. William Peter Powell qualified in 1857 and 1858. He worked as a house surgeon in the St Anne's District Hospital here in Liverpool and on a temporary basis in the London Liverpool South Hospital too. And as I said, he was then one of the doctors, one of the 13 black doctors in the United States Army during the Civil War. It would be very tempting to leave the Powells there in America, post-Civil War America. But we're not going to because Dr Powell went to California but came back to Liverpool. We know he was here in 1902 because on the 7th of June he was present in Prescott Street, West Derby when his 59-year-old brother, Isaiah, died from asthma. It's on the death certificate. The brother was a barrel maker. In 1916, Dr. Powell himself died in Kirkdale, West Derby. He was 81. Death, senile decay. We've got absolutely no idea what happened to the Powell children between those death certificates, 1902-1916, and Dr. Powell in the US Army. It's a 40-year-old gap in the history of what might be some rather important black Liverpool people, and I'm curious to know whether there were any Powells coming back to Liverpool, as we know that Isaiah and Dr Powell did. Now, I've got some final thoughts and questions, not to be answered, but just to throw around the back of your head or wherever you keep unanswerable questions. Uh, do we actually have a fixed view about where we will find black people? Uh, are there any strong beliefs about what they would have been doing? And if so, does this limit what we look for and therefore what we find? Thirdly, despite the amateur nature of family historians, do we use them enough? Another question, do we actually expect to find expatriate black Americans? And the descendants of the original migrant raised in Britain may have little or no connection with later arrivals and their concerns. So conclusions about Britain's visible minorities may need to distinguish between the two experiences. And from that comes the challenge of documenting their lives. Of these three self-motivated migrants, Mercy and William Powell and Jacob Christian, we see a black history element in a world that was much more nuanced than we've assumed. We broaden an understanding of British history if we follow the participation of visible minorities, but our assumptions have to be modified. We must include kilt-wearing infantrymen, shopkeepers, factory workers, capitalists, and people with birthplaces in the United States of America, and so on, and so on, and so on. If you want a copy of the supporting paper, 
you just write your name and email address. Best handwriting, please, on this. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Geoffrey. Uh, depending on the time to ask and answer, I think we've got time for one or two questions. If anybody has them for Geoffrey. Yes, Michael. How difficult it is to? Comparing family trees in America and family trees here in Britain. Is it easier to trace a line in America or is it easier to trace a line here in the UK? No, that's one, of the, that's one of the amazing things. I've been sending a couple of documents relating to the deaths of uh, ex American slaves who died in Britain to the archivist in Maryland. They were totally unaware that we didn't have slavery, we were unaware that a person of African descent would not be listed as coloured or Negro unaware that you can't find that column on the census, totally unaware that if you were black and buried, you would be buried in the same cemetery as if you were striped, spotty or whatever else. They just do not <coughs> understand. And so what they're looking for, Americans look for the segregated society. And obviously if you look for it, you find it. And I can tell you this, when I first started this game, this hobby of mine, I wasted an hour and a half in a library in South Carolina looking up uh, some important black people because I didn't notice the little bit at the back was for coloured folk and I was looking in the white section. So they look with a, segreg uh, a, a mindset for segregation. And there actually, is, as far as I know, there's no biography of William Peter Powell, the senior man, the union leader. And it's been, there was a cry for it. It's not even mentioned in the standard books. There was a cry for that back in 1975 for a reasonably respected historian. Never been done. And then when you look at these people, and I've looked at some dozens of Americans who settled in Britain, if you find their American details, they somehow leave Savannah, Georgia, and 15 years later, they're back in New York. And there's no idea what they're doing here. And it's, it's what I'm actually now doing. I'm, tra I'm tracing, attempting to trace the descendants of black American settlers of the 19th century. And American, believe it or not, when American information is very difficult to come by. Okay. Any more? Time for one more, I think. Yes. I'm 70 years old. <laughs> A sort of non-answer to your question is all these individuals that I research do not belong or participate in what we would now call black culture. Um, I've eaten meals there, I've never eaten fufu, I've never eaten aki, I've never eaten matoki, I've had boiled beef and carrots. You are looking at British blacks. Okay. So they're, they're aware, they're aware of their heritage. Margaret had a lovely set of uh, bronzes, um, an anklets from uh, Nigeria. And there's the odd, you know, the odd um, hippopotamus tooth and stuff like that, which have been shown to me. But they're not part of, I've never met anyone that's been part of what we would now call a black British history. Uh, black, 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 black Britain, sorry. And um, it makes you wonder how 
the people in that house where I started looking for the Christians, how they knew where the old lady had gone because she'd moved before the Second World War. So I think I can guess the answer. People thought of them as being different, but because they were going to the same church, children at the same school, you know, taking the dog for a walk, and all the things that people do, there isn't the strange exotic difference. There's also a rather important element, and that is the individuals weren't in a group themselves that was big enough for them not to have uh, friends within the larger society. And you'll see with the six surviving Christians, um, of the six surviving Christians, one married a person of African descent and five married people of European origin. Uh, but it's a very complex thing and we need to get more details on the actual black experience. Don't we, Ray? <laughs> <laughs> On that note, can we once again thank Geoffrey Dean?